Okay, so welcome to the second video uh, regarding the functional medicine and family uh, tour that we're going to be doing in a number of different cities around the U.S. and around the world. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about markers that you may not have heard of but need to be using. Now, in this case, you've heard this marker. We're going to talk about bilirubin, but you probably haven't heard about it in this way, at least unless people have changed what they're doing. When I was learning functional medicine and functional blood chemistry analysis, I was told that there is no optimal or functional low end of bilirubin. And that here's the reference range. If it was 0 0.01 or even 0, 0.00, <clears throat> that it was fine, that there was no reason for a low bilirubin. And it turns out that could not be further from the truth. And at the end of this one, uh, this video, my hope is that you will look at bilirubin entirely differently because it's an incredibly valuable marker. And a low bilirubin is absolutely a problem. Bilirubin, as you probably know, is a byproduct of red blood cell breakdown. When the red blood cells leave, uh, reach the end of their life, they go into the spleen. Usually, uh, macro, the liver can do it, but macrophages will tend to gobble up these old, decrepit red blood cells and break down everything on the inside. Now, hemoglobin is a component of this. Heme, hemoglobin gets broken down into heme and globin. Globin gets broken down into amino acids, and then heme eventually turns into, as you'll see, uh, bilirubin. <clears throat> now, here's a little bit more about bilirubin. There's, there's conjugated and unconjugated. We're not going to talk about that right now. But this is basically what happens. So here you can see heme as a byproduct of red blood cell breakdown via the enzyme heme oxygenase. Remember that because that's going to be important. It turns into biliverdin and then biliverdin. And this is really important. Remember this too, via the enzyme biliverdin reductase because it uses reducing agents, largely from the pentose phosphate pathway, also used to recycle uh, glutathione from its oxidized form to its antioxidant form uh, can turn into bilirubin. So this is important uh, to understand this pathway as well as the enzymes because if someone has low bilirubin, we might need to seek ways of trying to increase their bilirubin. Uh, this is just a real simple breakdown. I'll go more to this in the weekend. But here's the red blood cells. They start to get older. This is the spleen, for example. A macrophage breaks them down. Uh, and then it breaks down heme into biliverdin and then bilirubin, which circulates throughout the body and its unconjugated form goes to the liver to become conjugated and ends up in the intestines. Some of it can be recycled uh, and then some of it is lost in feces. Now, here's the thing. Bilirubin, this is an important one. It's an antioxidant and it turns out that is an, it's an antioxidant against uh, lipophilic uh, reactive oxygen species. So essentially fat soluble uh, and not water-soluble uh, reactive oxygen species. It's an antioxidant against lipid peroxidation and therefore may be decreased during oxidative stress, which I'll show you. Glutathione here, I said, is hydrophilic. Uh, so it tends to, glutathione is used for water-soluble reactive oxygen species. So this is, this is really important information. Uh, also, there seems to be a correlation between glutathione and uh, bilirubin because of that reducing agent, NADPH, which I talked about. So bilirubin appears to be the most potent antioxidant against lipid peroxides or reactive oxygen species that are fat soluble, that are attacking fat, which of course would be phospholipids in, in the membranes of all the cells. Because of this, low bilirubin has also been associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Now remember, I was taught in functional blood chemistry that there is no low end of bilirubin. This is not true. Low bilirubin is an indication of oxidative stress. It's associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, as you'll see, all-cause mortality. There is absolutely a low end to bilirubin, and we need to be evaluating this. Uh, bilirubin may also increase insulin sensitivity and protect against future diabetes. So this, again, I just want to show you. So here you have heme. Here's that heme oxygenase uh, requiring reducing agents, which is incredibly important. Turning it into biliverdin. Biliverdin via biliverdin reductase, and again, more reducing agents turn into bilirubin. But here's what I wanted to show you. Is here's a phospholipid bilayer membrane, lipophilic reactive species. Bilirubin as an antioxidant is donating an electron to those reactive oxygen species. And then when that happens, becoming biliverdin. Well, we need to be able to do two things in people that have low biliverdin. We might need to try to increase the amount of heme oxygenase so that they can break down heme into biliverdin more, but also we need to be able to convert biliverdin back into bilirubin as an antioxidant against these lipophilic reactive oxygen species. Now, I just showed you this from this paper. Also showed you glutathione in its antioxidant form uh, donates its electron or electrons uh, to soluble, water-soluble reactive oxygen species, becoming its oxidized or non-antioxidant form, and then via glutathione reductase uh, re re uh, requiring reducing agents, it becomes glutathione. So you can see now that bilirubin is interesting because let's say somebody has a lot of oxidative stress. Well, if they're using all of their NADPH 
towards glutathione for some reason, and they may not have enough in order to be able to convert bilirubin into bilirubin. So regardless of how you slice this, bilirubin, when low, is a marker of oxidative stress, period. This was a great paper, but I just want to show you the uh, association of bilirubin with a number of things. They're showing that bilirubin, uh, if it's low, may lead to endothelial dysfunction, which can lead to vascular smooth muscle, muscle proliferation, hypertension, endothelial damage, atherosclerosis, kidney damage, uremia, uh, vascular calcification, cardiovascular events, and all-cause mortality. But again, I was told that there was no such thing as a low bilirubin that wasn't problematic. But that's not true. Take a look at all of these papers, and that'd be very quick. We're just going to go through the titles, but this is just simply not true. So bilirubin is a protective factor for rheumatoid arthritis. The higher the bilirubin, the better the result with rheumatoid arthritis. The lower the bilirubin, the more symptoms that somebody uh, had with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And then these are just showing uh, usually inverse correlations between things. So a higher serum total bilirubin is associated with a lower risk of renal insufficiency. This one showed that lower bilirubin was associated with a higher amount of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This one showed in patients with type 2 diabetes, the lower the bilirubin, the higher the hemoglobin A1C. This one showed that the lower the bilirubin, the more impaired flow-mediated vasodilation is. Of course, that, that's a larger blood vessel for better blood flow. And lower bilirubin was, in, was associated with increased carotid intima media thickness, atherosclerosis of the carotid artery. This one, uh, similarly, was showing low bilirubin. The lower the bilirubin, the higher the amount of carotid atherosclerosis. This one, sorry for the writing here, uh, lower bilirubin was associated with a higher brachial ankle pulse wave velocity, and so there's worse blood flow. And then finally, this was the paper that, if you look at it here, says uh, bilirubin is associated with, low bilirubin is associated with total mortality, but how low? And so... Uh, just quickly to go through this, 0.6, a bilirubin of 0.6 was their reference. And basically what they showed in a variety of different models is that the lower the bilirubin went, the higher the, the risk, the hazard ratio for all-cause mortality, no matter which, whichever one they use, the lower the bilirubin. And so based on this, I say that a bilirubin of 0.4 or below, you could even make an argument of 0.5 or below. But a bilirubin definitely of 0.4 or below is a problem. It's a marker of oxidative stress, specifically of fat-soluble oxidative stress or lipid peroxidation or glutathione being used up. But it's oxidative stress. And bilirubin of 0.4 or below is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality. So here's the traditional reference range. I basically, uh, on that one, there's a few papers, but that one in particular that a, an optimal reference range for bilirubin is at least 0.4 or below is too low and therefore needs to be addressed. Looking at this again, I just want to show you that there are, and this is just a couple of papers, which give, again, giving you a taste of what you're going to get in the functional medicine and family weekend. But if we can increase heme oxygenase, then maybe we can increase biliveridin and therefore bilirubin. We could also seek ways of increasing biliveridin reductase or, of course, supplying more reducing agents of NADPH. So here's just a couple quick papers looking at some botanical extracts that they increased heme oxygenase. In this case, there's carnivore from rosemary, curcumin you've probably heard of, uh, green tea extract. These all have been shown to somewhat increase heme oxygenase. Here's another paper showing that uh, curcumin uh, may have uh, reduced reactive oxygen species by increasing heme oxygenase expression. I'm going to cover this more during the weekend, but if bilirubin is high for some reason, it could be because red blood cells are being broken down too much, liver dysfunction, bile duct obstruction, as well as the genetic uh, cause of Gilbray's syndrome. But if it's low, and this is really what we're talking about, there is a low end of bilirubin. We need to be evaluating it as such. I gave you the reference range based off that one paper, though there's a couple. Could be a marker of oxidative stress, and then I'll cover this during the weekend as well. You can look at it, some other oxidative stress markers. Or zinc deficiency. It turns out that biliveridin reductase is a zinc de deficient enzyme. So if you go back to that slide where you saw biliveridin reductase turning biliveridin into bilirubin, if somebody is zinc deficient, then they're not going to have adequate uh, activity of biliveridin reductase and therefore low levels of bilirubin. So if you see low bilirubin, it could be oxidative stress, it could be low zinc, it could be a combination of both, but it's definitely something to pay attention to. So uh, I have more calculations, but more markers that you probably haven't heard of are going to be covered during the weekend. Space, if you now want to go, please choose the date and location that works best for you. I'd be really excited to see you there. It means so much to me. 
And then in the last video, I'm going to be talking about reference ranges that you may not have heard of, but that you need to practice. Thank you so very much.